I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that our interviewee for this episode of On the Shelf is one of the best known authors in Ireland. He worked for a while as a journalist before he published his debut in the early 90s. It was called Cowboys and Indians and it did very well. But the kind of international mega success that only happens to a handful of authors came in the noughties and that was with the publication of Star of the Sea. Since then, his books have included Ghost Light and Redemption Falls, and his latest novel is Shadow Play. It's about the life of Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula, his time spent working as a theatre manager in London, and his relationship with theatre impresario and actor Henry Irving. Uh, we're in South Dublin to visit his home and have a look at his bookshelves, and he's going to talk to us about the five books that have meant something to him. So we are in Joseph O'Connor's study mm -hmm. office. Yeah. What do you call this room? Oh, um, I don't really call it anything, but it's where I work. Um, okay. At the desk there, if I'm not at, uh, if I'm not in my office at the University of Limerick, this is, this is where I work and this is where I read and yeah, I spend a lot of time in this room. And are all your books in this room, or is there like, no. is there certain? <clears> no, a oh. tiny fraction of them. Um, I have them in other rooms. There's a room at the end of the garden with books. There are books in UL, um, books all over the place. But is there any logic to what gets to go where? Um, or? About once every two years, uh, I become very Virgo and alphabetize them, and uh, and and then it um, it falls out of logic slowly over the next two years. And, oh yeah, um, I see all the B's yeah. behind me. Yeah, yeah, B is easier for some reason. By the time it gets down to S and T, it <laughs> just all crumbles. So I'm pretty good on the A's and the B's. Okay. But I like working in this room because it's, um, because it's a family room. I mean, people walk in and out through the room as I'm working. And um, I actually find that quite um, comforting and consoling. I don't like it to be too quiet. When I'm writing, I, well, I, I like to have some something going on in the background. Um, before <laughs> we were filming, we just mentioned that idea of the pram in the hall, but you don't find that distracting having family pass No, by? I don't. I mean, my eldest son is is nineteen now, and I can remember um, thinking about this issue obviously around the time he was born. But I, I think becoming a parent obviously deepens your stake in the world in all sorts of ways, okay. everything about you, including your work. Uh, and my feelings about my writing definitely changed around the time that James was born. You know, I, I had published four or five books and, you know, they were grand and I'd always kind of put 100% effort into them, but I didn't worry about them too much once they were out in the world, if they got mixed reviews or whatever. I didn't really care, I just thought I'll, I'll write another one. But I can remember around the time James came into the world that I started wanting to write something that would hang around and something that would be on the shelves for this kid to read um, in the fullness of time. And uh, just started putting, you know, 102% in. So the book that I wrote around then was Star of the Sea. And I, I really wrote that for James. Um, I, he he was a huge help to me. His his arrival in the world was a huge help in terms of writing that book. And I think I became a better writer and a better user of my writing time through becoming a parent. So so I, I found it the complete opposite of the pram in the hall effect. This, this is very, uh, this is exactly what I want to hear. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> it's true. And, and uh, funnily enough, I mean, a number of close friends of mine who were writers would, would say the same thing. I never found it um, a, a distraction in ways that were unhelpful. Mm. Um, it, it actually broadens how you look at the world and it's good for a writer not to think about yourself all the time. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. We okay. have that tendency sometimes. Um, and as I say, I think it just kind of spreads out and deepens your, your, your stake in the world. You okay. think about why you're here. So. Well, speaking of teenagers, um, the first book, I don't know when you read it, but I know it's often a book that's read as a teenager, was, yeah. which is The Catcher in the Rye. Catcher in the Rye, J.D. Salinger, was uh, published in 1951, and I read it in um, 1978 or 1979 when I was uh, 17. Um, I just loved it. I had never read anything 
like that before. I had never encountered anything like the sort of ballsy, sardonic voice of Holden Caulfield, who is himself 17. Mm. Um, I just read the book with huge kind of excitement. I loved the kind of naughtiness of it. I loved the attitude of it. I mean, in the opening lines, he, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but there's something like, you know, I suppose you want me to give you all the usual autobiographical crap. Yeah. uh, All that David Copperfield rubbish, but I'm not going to. So like you read that as a bookish kid who's actually enjoying reading David Copperfield and Great Expectations and all of that stuff that you're told to read in school. But suddenly here's a voice from left field kind of destroying the entire tradition of the English novel in the opening five or six lines of the book. Um, so so it was just fantastic to, to come across that. And um, Coco the dog agrees. Yeah, um, good. Uh, Everyone in the house is yeah. a fan. Um, but did you get the feeling that I got, the, well, that I think a lot of people read it as teenagers and they it's a cliche now, but they think they are understood when they read this novel. Like, did it resonate um, further than other books you were reading? Yeah, I think, you know, for people of my age, I mean, I think it has changed. I think the whole notion of what a teenager is, of course, has changed so yeah. much from when the book was written. I mean, that word, even the word teenager didn't exist then. Um, but I, I, I definitely had a sense of, um, here's somebody who's speaking for me. Here's somebody who sounds like I would like to sound, I mean, much more articulate and funny than the 17-year-old me, but at the same time, thoughts that were not a million miles away about the phoniness of the world and mm. how teachers are not to be trusted and how the world is a battle between those who are authentic and those who are fake. Yeah. It's also very, very funny. Um, and interestingly enough, I mean, for me, Catcher in the Rye Pass is one of the great tests or one of the tests of any great novel, which is it changes as you change. I mean, as you read The Catcher in the Rye as an older person, it kind of shape shifts and it becomes a different sort of book and the things that you enjoyed as a young reader are still there. Yeah. But you see the book's darker colours. You see the sadness of Holden, how isolated he is. There's, there's a very powerful scene. It's, he's in Manhattan and he's, he's talking about crossing Fifth Avenue uh, and the traffic not bothering him because he's invisible. Nobody can see me. The traffic wouldn't hit me anyway. It would drive through me. So when you're 17, you think that's funny. And when you're older, particularly, I guess, as, as a parent, mm. you, you see the darkness and the sadness and how this kid needs a lot of help. But I love the book. Um, it is definitely uh, the book that made me want to be a writer okay. uh, myself. I mean, the context was in my mid-teens, I was reading a lot. But I can remember the actual moment. I could probably date it if I thought about it carefully enough. I can remember the moment of turning the last page of the catcher in the rye, and that was the spark. I, I, I just felt that's what I want to do with my life. You were, because I know you were a journalist for a few years before before you wrote your first novel, but it was always leading towards writing books, was it? That's what I wanted to do. I mean, yeah. I worked as a journalist when I was, you know, a student, and, mm. in, you know, in the summers and a little bit after that, um, because it was the only way I could think of of making a living from, yeah. uh, from writing. And I really value that experience. I mean, I loved being around journalists. It was a fascinating time in Irish journalism. Uh, There was McGill and the Sunday Tribune and Hot Press and even in Dublin, um, which which had a real personality, you know, as a magazine. Um, So I would go on the bus from UCD into to work in McGill and, you know, Jean Carrigan might be um, in one corner and Eamon McCann in another and Mary Holland would be in and Nell McCafferty would be in. the brilliant writers yeah, yeah, yeah. as well as great r- reporters. And, and I suppose a new sense that journalism was for something in Ireland, which, you know, when I talk to younger people now, my students and stuff, I don't think they understand that, like, before that time, there was no notion in, in Ireland that the media was to call power to account. Yeah, I mean, yeah. various newspapers represented various party points of view and were quite open about it and mm. people th- th- thought that's what the newspapers are for. Um, but with McGill and the Tribune and Vincent Brown uh, and all, all those writers, there was a great kind of energy um, and a, a great sort of repurposing of journalism. So I loved being around that as a kid. I also liked the company of journalists. I still do. I find um, them a, a very... Um, 
a very maligned group um, for their alcoholism and their laziness and all of that. I, I didn't find that. I mean, I found they were very, very hardworking. Um, people would be in the Sunday Tribune office at, at kind of two o'clock in the morning and they were smart people who knew stuff about what was going on yeah. uh, in Ireland. So that was a fascinating thing. And also I think the discipline of being a journalist was a great thing for a creative writer to learn because, yeah. as you know, if you are working for a newspaper, you're writing a column and it's due on Thursday afternoon and it's a thousand words. It needs to be in five o'clock on Thursday afternoon. There is no point in sending it at six o'clock and there's no point in it being 1200 words exactly, of yeah. the most beautiful prose since Scott Fitzgerald because somebody will just get out of scissors and cut it. So, so it was fantastic in terms of being able to write to, to order, being able to write now. Um, and I have found that a very useful thing all through my career. Yeah. I don't wait for the muse to, to, to come. I'm able to kind of summon the muse. Okay. And, I, and I think I learned that as a kid uh, working in the Sunday Tribune and Miguel. Um, and so to move on to another one, because uh, yeah. like Dracula, which uh, feeds into Shadow Play, your, your yeah. most recent novel, but is that when you first came across this? Or like no, I, I, I would have read Dracula uh, again as a kid, as a teenager. Right. And, you know, I loved the book. But what really um, took me uh, about the book was not, not just the character. I mean, it's a great character and he's kind of, Dracula's more interesting than the kind of nice people who are trying to hunt him down. And, yeah. you know, he's very charismatic. He's very attractive. But it was really the structure of the book. I think technically um, the book is a masterpiece. Um, Stoker did things that really hadn't been done before. It kind of offers itself to the reader with great urgency as a collection of documents. There are journal entries, there are letters, there are transcriptions from audio recordings, there are telegrams. So it, it adds great uh, texture and variety, um, which just really struck me as a kid. And then when I started to write, I forgot about it a bit. But in my third novel, which is called The Salesman, I started to use that technique of different documents. Mm. And then in Star of the Sea, um, which, as I mentioned, is uh, 18 years old now. Uh, I really kind of went for it there. There are, there are traditional ballads, letters, newspaper clippings. There's a, a large kind of dollop of the Gothic. Um, Pius Mulvey, the anti-hero of the book, um, is introduced in the opening pages. Um, a bit like uh, Dracula in mm. some of some of some of his uh, traits and it was the book that I kind of mentally had on the desk beside me as I was writing Star of the Sea. Did critics pick that up at the time? Yeah, okay. some, so, some of them did. Um, <coughs> Star of the Sea is set in 1847, it was yeah. a little bit before Dracula, but it's the high point, I suppose, of the English novel. Wuthering Heights is published in 1847. Okay. Um, you have um, the Brontes and George Eliot, Dickens, doing these amazing things with this form whose rules are not fully understood yet. Um, so there are cliffhangers and there's melodrama and the, the stock characters but being given a twist to make them seem more real. So I kind of borrowed all of those techniques uh, in order to give the book that page-turning quality because I knew it was going to be a long book and as a reader I'm impatient with long books. Yeah. Um, so, so I thought that Stoker-esque approach of kind of varying the voices who are telling the story um, would just help to give it momentum. So I, I love that about Stoker's work. Um, so I, I used it in Star of the Sea and obviously I've used it in Shadow Play Shadow as well. Play. So, um, staying with the somewhat with the Gothic, uh, My Cousin Rachel, which I love, yeah. um, Daphne du Maurier. Um, so why did you pick this? Again, it's just a book I've always um, loved. Um, I was thinking before I met you today, I think that I found my cousin Rachel on my grandmother's uh, bookshelves one summer when I was staying in her house and um, I was just very captivated by it. Um, the figure of Rachel herself is such an intriguing kind of mesmeric presence. She has the same effect on us, the reader, as she does on, on Philip and Ambrose and all of the people in this rather male yeah. household that she suddenly arrives into. She's a very powerful, smart, funny um, woman who's constructed a number of selves in, in order to kind of make her way in the world. Um, it's a great page turner. 
it's beautifully written. I think Daphne du Maurier at her best um, is, is still a bit under-regarded and there's no doubt that she's one of those writers who's been shunted into the women's fiction mm. siding, which went on a bit during her life and it was something she was aware of. And we know there are letters from Daphne to her publisher saying, you know, does the book have to have this kind of cover? Um, oh, right, and, okay. and, and the, the publisher writing back and saying, well, well, no, we can make it look more literary and then you'll have 10% of the sales. So it's something that she had to kind of wrestle so that herself. existed. The, oh, that, that definitely like existed then. Then, yeah. yeah well. it, it definitely did. But I, I, I think um, my cousin Rachel and Rebecca, I suppose, which they're twin works. Yeah. I mean, they're set in the same house, um, which is the house that Daphne lived in herself. Um, and, you know, I had the opportunity then to adapt the book for the stage, which is a really intriguing thing to do always but I to just was noticing there is a photo yeah, from it here yeah, yeah. That to, was for the to, gate for the gate yeah originally um but to adapt a book that you love uh, is a really interesting experience because I suppose all adaptation is a form of, of kind of loving critique mm. isn't it? you can't put everything in so I suppose you heighten the aspects that you love and you and you kind of diminish the ones that you're not so crazy about so it gives you your chance to do like a cover version of a classic that you that you really love and it was an intriguing process and to try and deliver on stage the ambiguity and the ambivalence of the famous ending of my cousin Rachel which we won't talk about yeah. in case people are going to read it it's a very difficult thing to do because you can get away with ambiguity in a novel um, in a way that you can't really on the stage yeah. on the stage people kind of want they in the car on the way home they want to know what happened during mm. the play so to deal with that um, was a challenging thing but it's a really interesting book people often ask Daphne du Maurier herself what what happened at the end of uh, my cousin Rachel and she she always said she genuinely didn't know um, she she really had no clue so so that that wonderful kind of uncertainty um, colours the whole of this yeah. beautifully written book and I, I, I just see new things in it all the time I mean I was just looking at it before you coming over I, I underline and I make notes when I'm reading so you've but read it several times oh I've, I've read it a lot back, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean you know there's a lot of notes and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and I, I like kind of having a conversation with the book uh, and that would be so fairly typical. You're not po faced about writing on books? Um, no, I'm no. not, as okay. you, as you yeah, can see. Yeah, yes, I can see, okay, I turn um, the pages. I, I'm, I'm really not. But it's, it's, it's a wonderful, beautiful, strange uh, book full, full of um, chiaroscuro, I suppose, that kind of light and shadow and sexual ambiguity and all of that. Yeah. And a great um, achievement. And, um, and the play is coming back uh, again this autumn on a UK uh, okay. tour. This okay. time, so it'll be fascinating to see it again. Okay, um, and we move on to something a little different. Um, mm. Patty Smith. A little different, not very different, maybe. Um, no. In some ways, um, Patty Smith. I have loved since my sixteenth birthday, when my aunt, who lived in London, sent me uh, ten pounds as a present, a fortune at the time. Yeah. I went into town to Freebird Records, which was then in a murky little basement on the North Keys of the Liffey, and I was leafing through the punk rock records, and I came across this strange cover. You know, the punk covers are very lurid, yeah. blackmail lettering and day glow and all of that. Um, this is like a classic black and white photograph. It looked like a still from one of those very cool French movies of this rather androgynous looking figure. Um, the touch of Keith Richards uh, about her and the jacket thrown over the shoulder in a kind of raffish way. Uh, and I was just taken by the cover. It's the only record I've ever bought in 40 years of buying records purely for the cover. Yeah, okay. Um, and so, so had you never heard of her no, at I that point? No, okay. I hadn't, no. It was Patti Smith's um, Horses, and I took it home and played it that night, and the world just burst into colour. Um, I really had heard nothing like this um, before. The kind of strangeness and the intelligence and the lyricism uh, of the writing, and this incredible instrument that was Patti Smith's voice that could go from a whisper to... A scream you know in a couple of seconds some moments it was like a violin and then it was like a saxophone um, and I, I just 
hadn't heard any particular woman singer constructing a voice in that way um, before. So I, I loved the record and bought all of her records. You, um, music is, and like you're a novelist first and foremost, but music has come in and out of all yeah. your work and throughout. Like, uh, is it something that you love that you do in mm. your spare time, or what is it? No, I, I'm, I, I'm not a musician. I but mean, my kids are, it. and they, okay. I love when you know, I love hearing them playing music in the house. But I have come to think, I suppose, since Star of the Sea, mm. um, the musicality of prose is something that's become more important to me. I think I was kind of missing a trick in some of my early books. I don't know why, because I've always loved music, but I think I was so um, caught up with telling a story and trying to have characters that would resonate that I didn't realise that words are sounds before they're anything else. Okay. I mean, anyone who's ever been around a baby or a toddler knows that. that why we are so attracted to nursery rhymes and all of that stuff when we're little is the something in the sounds. Mm. So with Star of the Sea, I suppose I started to try to find the music of the story before I really started to write it. Very much the same thing with Shadow Play. And mm. I always kind of do that now. I try and have a sense of what the book is going to sound like um, before I set out to, to write it. And I, I found that a very revealing um, thing. And probably one of the writers who helped me with that was, was Patti Smith. And before I move on to the last book, you mentioned earlier before you were filming that you met her, but I didn't get the story. Yeah, no, it was about 10 years ago and uh, myself and Anne-Marie and the kids were living in New York. I was teaching at a, a university there and we went to see Patti Smith playing one night and I was writing a column for one of the Irish newspapers at the time and so the column that week was a review of Patti Smith's show which I loved. So I went into work in the college on Monday morning and there was an email from the newspaper back in Dublin saying I don't know if this is kosher or not but there's an email here from somebody saying that they're Patti Smith and she read your review on online and, and she wants to be in touch. So I write back like really cautiously convinced this is one of my old college mates yeah, taking yeah, the yeah, out yeah. of me because they know how much I love Patty. So I write back very cautiously, dear Miss Smith, I heard you wanted to be in touch. And she writes and says, thank you very much for that very kind um, review. It's very gracious of you. Sometime when I'm in Dublin, we must have a cup of tea. So I write back and say, well, I, I'm actually in New York at the moment and I'm teaching you know five blocks from your house <laughs> so she says okay come around um, this afternoon so it was the day before Christmas Eve and I bought her a book I bought her a bunch of lilies and went knocked on the door of the house and until the moment when the door opened I still wasn't sure uh, if it would be her but the door opened and she said nothing she stepped into the porch of her house and she embraced me and I thought, God, you can kill me now. This that, that's, that's the that's dream of, they say, don't meet your idols, but <clears throat> absolutely meet Patty Smith. Yeah, so we went yeah. into the house and um, we sat and had a chat for two or three hours. She asked me to bring one of my books. Um, I, so I, I had a copy of a book of mine, Redemption Falls. And she said, um, so will you read me a bit of the book? So, so I sat in the music room. I read her a couple of pages from Redemption Falls. She picked up a battered old 12 string guitar at one point, played a few chords, and then I walked home through the snow. After, that is, I, kill I me that, now. That, that, yeah, yeah. That, you know, <laughs> um, that is just dream come true. That's amazing. Um, stuff. And she, she was absolutely everything on the level of Don't Meet Your Heroes. She was everything that I, I had always thought she would be, and more, because um, she was very smart and very funny um, and really switched on and very creative. But of course, I had expected. 27-year-old um, Patty Smith from the cover of Horses to open the door. And that's not what happened, because no. she's now yeah. of okay. a certain age. So she has all of the punk thing and all of the attitude, but she also has the wisdom and grace that mm. some older people have. It was like meeting Virginia Woolf or something, you know? Yeah. Um, so it was a lovely afternoon, and we've never met since, and I that's probably fine. don't really want to. Yeah, exactly, you don't want to ruin the memory. Um, <laughs> okay. so, so I love this book, M Train. The very last book, um, yeah. Proust. Proust, yeah. Um, I've always kind of felt that the great big gap um, in my life as a reader is um, Marcel Proust and his great uh, multi-volume 
novel A la Recherche de Tom Perdu, In Search of uh, Time Past. I've had a couple of goes at it over the years. It has always defeated me. Um, but as it happens, uh, this summer um, I started again. So this is Swan's Way, which is the opening volume. Um, brilliant translation by, by Lydia Davis, whose own, whose own short stories okay. I really like a lot. And it's the first time Proust has begun to make sense um, to me. So I, I, the first week or 10 days, I really had to persist with it. And now I'm into it and I can see what all the fuss is about. Um, mentioned Virginia Woolf a moment ago. She said when she read Proust, she just thought, what's the point? I'm giving up. Um, I read a piece by Anne Enright recently, Advice to Young Writers. Yeah. And she said, well, just one of the things I want you to know, you're never going to be as good as Proust, because um, none, none of us are. Um, beautiful, long, rolling sentences, multiple clauses, some of them go going on for a page, um, just full of fantastic uh, grace and movement and energy. Um, and it's, it's just very captivating. It's not a particularly plotty um, experience, but just to be reminded of the possibilities of the rhythm and the music of language. Um, it's a wonderful reading experience. And do you expect that you will make it to the end? I'm going to make it to the end, yeah. I've just okay. not, I've, I'm just, I'm going to persist with Marcel. We've said it on camera now, people. so uh, yeah. that means you have to do it. Yeah. So. And, a, and a, fa a fascinating man. He, he was very ill, and as people know, he lived for many years in his cork-lined room. Yeah. In Paris, among his illnesses was a form of asthma, which meant he, he was particularly um, vulnerable to uh, pollen and stuff, so he couldn't go out a lot. And the image of breathlessness comes up a lot, um, I've noticed in the book. And I, I just wonder if there's something in the long, rolling sentences that was his way of breathing. You know, somebody mentioned this to me um, recently. Uh, you know, there is a view among some critics that that might be what's going on, that he, he found some space and expansiveness mm. in the sentence that he couldn't find in life. But a terrific masterpiece and just, just a wonderful uh, reminder to any reader of what's, what's possible with these brittle little uh, ink stains called words. Okay, and on that I'll leave it, so thanks very much. A great um, pleasure. I'll probably never read Proust, but I might read M Train. Yeah. Uh, that's all for this episode and we'll be back next time with another author.